Retro Static Radio proudly takes pleasure in bringing you a parade of outstanding thriller, sci-fi, and horror. The most notable melodramas from stage and screen, fiction and radio, presented to bring you to the edge of your chair to keep you in... Suspense. Good evening. This is Arthur Carey, and proud I am to bring you another tale for Retrostatic Radio, alongside my friends and fellow voices in tonight's program. Tonight, we debut a staple of the mystery genre, the impossible crime of a murder in a locked room. In the standard mystery, the question being deduced is who did it and why. In a locked room mystery, the question is how the crime was committed. Add to it a dash of witchcraft and the supernatural, and a truly special story unfolds. Based on the iconic novel by John Dixon Carr, this is The Burning Court. Ah, a glass of sherry by the fireside of a beautiful suburban home. What could be more comforting? You're an admirable post, Mr. Despard. And it's really a shame our first meeting is under such a cloud. It's also a shame I have so little time to tell you which one of your guests here murdered your uncle last week. Now, let's see. Now, I believe we're all here. Your wife, your friend, Mr. Stevens, Captain Brennan, Yes, and incidentally yourself. Just who did you say you were? No wonder you've had so much difficulty with the case, Captain. My name is Cross. Gordon Cross, the writer. As a matter of fact, it's because of my just-completed book, Poisoning Throughout the Ages, that I happen to be here now. And Ted Stevens there happens to be a member of the firm which publishes my work. I'd never seen him until tonight, but I've been told what happened. This afternoon, he began reading my manuscript for the first time on the train, the commuter's train, which every afternoon deposits him safely and soundly here in Crispin. I imagine he was halfway home by the time he finished the first chapter. Then he turned a page. Attached to the following leaf was a picture, and looking at it, the young man stiffened suddenly, and all but cried out his shock. It was a picture of a young woman, and under it had been printed, Famous Poisoner Marie Dubray, 1676. Ted Stevens was looking at a picture of his own wife. Imagine! Imagine his 25-year-old wife in 17th century costume. The face, the features, even the wistfulness of expression were identical. Even the name, Dubray, was his wife's maiden name. But no, 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 that was ridiculous. This woman in the picture was, well, one of his wife's ancestors. Yes, that was it, that was it. Simply an amazing family resemblance. Marie would be waiting for him at the station, and he'd have to tell her about it. He wondered why, however, she'd never told him about... <laughs> well, but you don't discuss such an ancestor, do you? Ted Stevens glanced down at the chapter to which the picture had been attached. It was entitled, The Affair of the Non-Dead Woman. Hello, Ted. Stevens was almost jolted from his seat. It was Dr. Weldon, professor of English at the college, an old friend of his. Oh, hi. I didn't see you there, Doc. Oh, here. Have a seat. Quickly, he thrust the picture beneath the manuscript and moved over. I thought maybe you would give me the, uh, uh, what's the phrase? The brush off? No, no, I say. You may actually be the one person who could help. Yeah? Very flattering. Remember those discussions we used to have about murders? Oh, yes. Better than bridge. Anytime. I got the idea that you'd made some sort of hobby out of the older cases, the historic ones. 
I've studied them thoroughly, yes. Ever hear of a woman named Marie Dubray? Marie Dubray? Hmm, Marie Dubray, Marie Dubray, Marie Dubray, uh, 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 oh yes, that was her maiden name, of course. One of the finest specialists in arsenic poison you could ever hope to find. Oh, we're almost at our station, Ted. Let's get to the door. Yes, a real charmer Marie was. Must have disposed of half a hundred husbands, lovers, suitors, and just plain friends before she was caught. Uh, what happened to her, Doc? She was beheaded and... Well burned. All stop for Crispin. All stop for Crispin. Oh, absurd, laughable. Ted Stevens kept saying this to himself, and yet what he knew was a foolish dread followed him straight through the small suburban station and clung to him as he reached the street. And there, in the roadster, was Marie, leaning toward him a little to hold the door open and smiling at him. Oh, Ted, what on earth are you staring at? That street light shining on your hair. I like it. Oh, don't be slick. Get in the car. Just like that, like a wisp of smoke, it was gone. That whole ridiculous fear, the delusion. When at home, Marie brought the cocktails into the living room. The logs were burning brightly in the fireplace, throwing a soft dancing glow upon a room that was darkening with dusk. To you, my darling. And to you, dear. As Stevens placed his glass down, he noticed the manuscript of my book. It was there on the table, right where he'd placed it when he first came in. Deliberately, he turned from it, and then turned back. The manuscript had been moved. Only an inch or so, but it had been moved. Keeping his back to his wife, he thumbed through that early chapter and discovered, just as he knew he would, that the photograph was gone. For a long moment, he thought of what to do. Then slowly, he turned around. This book I brought home. Yes? There was a story of a prisoner in it. Funny thing is that her name happened to be the same as yours. Well, your maiden name, anyhow. Oh, that's odd, isn't it? Darling, was she a relative of yours? Why, Ted, you're serious. In a way, yes. Oh, I don't mean it's really important. It's just that, well, when you run across a person who's a dead ringer for your own wife, and who lived 300 years ago and was a top-flight prisoner. Well, you like to hear about it, that's all. What on earth are you talking about? Darling, be honest with me. Didn't you look at my manuscript when I was out of the room earlier? No. Why would I? You didn't take the picture of the prisoner out of it? I most certainly did not. Ted, what is this all about? What are you getting at? Just that someone removed the photo of Marie Dubray since I've been home and... Now who's that? I'll check out the window. I don't want to. Why is Mark? Mark the Spurred. Mark? Now, Ted, wait a second. Whatever he wants, promise you won't do it. Promise I won't do what? Don't get involved in whatever he says. Just... Don't go out tonight, please. What in the world are you? Either way, we can't have him stay out on the porch all night. Mark. Hi. Come on in. How are you? Uh, thanks, Ted. I'm, I'm doing fine. I was just thinking about giving you a call later. Oh, let me take your hat. Thank you, Mary. Mary, I I hope you'll excuse me for popping in so late, but I, well, I need to speak with Ted. It's rather important. I don't mind at all. Come on, Mark. We'll step into the library. Do you mind, dear? Of course not. If you need me to make sandwiches or something, please let me know. I'll pour us a couple of drinks. 
So what seems to be a trouble, Mark? My Uncle Miles was murdered. Murdered? Oh, the talk hasn't reached you yet, but it's already started. Nothing definite, of course. Just that there was something wrong about Uncle Miles' death. But that doesn't mean... Mark, are you sure of this? Do you know it was murder? I don't know. Of course I don't. I just don't see how it could be any other option. Uncle Miles, you know, had been sick for quite a while, but last Saturday he seemed so much better that Miss Corbett, uh, that was his nurse, decided to take the day off, and, and, well, you know all this, you and Mary were over that afternoon. Anyways, Lucy and I went to the club that night, to that masquerade party, and we left the old boy completely alone. I've cursed myself a thousand times since. But what about your housekeeper, Mrs... Um... What's her name? Henry? No. Henderson? Wasn't Mrs. Henderson around? Oh, sure. In that little house out back. We told her to look in on him now and then, but apparently that wasn't good enough. It was after midnight when Lucy and I got back. Uncle Miles was dying. Ted... It looked exactly like one of his regular attacks, but then later... After he was gone, I happened, I happened to glance under the chest of drawers in his room. There was a small silver cup under there, almost drained, and and Uncle Miles's cat laying next to it. The cat was still warm, but quite dead. Oh. I managed to get the cat out of the house and buried without anyone seeing me. Next day, I had the contents of the cup analyzed. So it was poison? Arsenic. This sounds like a matter for the police. What do you want me to do? Help me open the crypt. Excuse me? I want to have a private autopsy performed. Help me get Uncle Miles' body out of that vault. Oh, I know it's a tough job. The thing is sealed solid, but, but we can do it. You mean without the police knowing about it all? Without anybody knowing about it. Mrs. Henderson's visiting her sister, and I managed to send Lucy over to the club. You must be crazy. You're playing with dynamite, Mark. This is something you've got to tell the police now. I can't take that chance. But they'll have to know sometime. You're only delaying the- I've got to know first. You don't understand, Ted. There was somebody in Uncle Miles' house that night, handing him something. Something in a silver cup. Mrs. Henderson was on the porch by the window. She saw her. She saw her? Ted, Mrs. Henderson thinks that it's her. That that, that her is my wife. Oh, Lucy. It doesn't mean anything to Mrs. Henderson yet, because she doesn't suspect anything, but, well, Ted, you've got to see why I've got to be sure. Why I've got to know how Uncle Miles died. Because it wasn't Lucy, Ted. I know it wasn't. Of course not, Mark. She has an alibi. I mean, you said it yourself. She was at the club with you, right? Y yes, uh, except for a half hour. I see. So you'll help me, won't you? When do we start? As soon as you can make it. Well, no time like the present for grave robbing. Come on now, I'll get your hat. You trot on ahead and I'll come over as soon as I speak with Marie. You're not going to tell her about this, are you? Of course not. I'll think of something, though. Don't you worry about it. Thanks a lot, Ted. Truly, truly, sincerely, thank you. How am I ever going to... Going to what, dear? Oh, Marie, I, uh, Mark asked if I could... I know, Ted. Here, you'd better take these sandwiches with you. You'll get hungry up there. But, you knew I'd be going out? Yes, I knew. You listened in on us for the door, didn't you? I couldn't help it, Ted. I had an idea what Mark's visit was about... To talk about his uncle's death. There's a lot of gossip about it in the village. That's why I tried to tell you, why I didn't want you to get mixed up in it. But it's too late now, isn't it? I mean, you're going. I can tell by the way you look. Ted, wait a second. There's just one thing I want to tell you before you leave, and that is no matter what happens, no matter what you find or think or believe, I love you. You'll remember that, won't you? I'll remember. I'll remember you said so, Marie. 
By the light of a dim kerosene lantern, Mike Despard and Ted Stevens pounded their way through the thick shelf of rock that covered the Despard's ancestral tomb, pried open the great slab of stone which lay across the subterranean door, and then, at last, descended to the dank, ink-black chamber. They found the last resting place of Uncle Mike. But as the dust cleared, a greater mystery formed. Mark! It's empty! What? No, it, it can't be. But it is! Look for yourself! No body! That can only mean the body wasn't in this coffin when it was placed here. From the time that coffin was closed on Uncle Miles, somebody, the Undertaker, or Lucy, or me, somebody was with it until it was buried. The crypt was sealed right after. Then somebody had to beat us here. Somebody's broken in here ahead of us. Broke in? Lucy and I have hardly left the house since the funeral. Do you think anybody could break in here, smash through that stone and cement without our seeing them? Without our hearing them? Well, well what? Well, you might as well come out then. What? Who's there? Me, Mr. Despard, up here. My name is Captain Brennan. I'm from the office of the Commissioner of Police. From the... I'd like to speak with you, if you don't mind, Mr. Despard. Just follow my flashlight up here, please. But I don't understand. How did you... how did you know about this? By listening, mainly. Do you mind if we go up to your house, Mr. Despard? No, no, no. No, not at all. Thank you. Lieutenant Gray, this is Mark Despard and, I believe, Ted Stevens. Pleased to meet you both. How do you know my name, Captain Brennan? Uh, very simply. I got the names of everybody who was here at the Despards the day the old man died. You and your wife were included. Oh, here we are. But I didn't... G Captain, who gave you those names? Your housekeeper, of course. Mrs. Henderson? You didn't think Mrs. Henderson saw the dead cat, did you, Mr. Despard? But she did. She also saw you bury it. And we've been interested in the case ever since. Well, nice place you have here, Mr. Despard. Now let's see. According to Mrs. Henderson, your wife was wearing some kind of a masquerade costume that night. What kind of a thing was it? Oh, well, it was a... Uh... Uh, oh, oh, there. You can see it right there. It was copied from the dress in that old painting over there. Oh, yes. Hmm. Funny. Where's the woman's face? It's always been that way, long as I can remember. Somebody must have thrown acid or something on it. Can't blame them much, though. I mean, she was a poisoner. A poisoner? Oh, yes. I've read about her. Learned all her poison tricks from one of her lovers, a guy named uh, Gordon St. Croix. Gordon St. Oh, yes, Mr. Stevens. We cops read every now and again. Did you say Gordon St. That's French. We call it cross. Ha! Absolutely no limit to a cop's education, is there? <laughs> but to get back to your wife, Mr. Despard, she was dressed like the famous Marie. Now, when Mrs. Henderson looked through that window... Now, just wait a minute, Captain. Mrs. Henderson can't prove she saw a thing and you know it. Oh, what do you mean? I mean, you haven't any right to insinuate that my wife was in that room. Well, who's insinuating? I'm trying to say that Mrs. Henderson, after thinking it over, realized that she was tricked by the costume. The woman she saw in the funny clothes, handing the cup of poison to your uncle, wasn't your wife at all. What? Because your wife is an unusually tall young woman, and the one Mrs. Henderson saw was fully half a head shorter. More on the order, let's say, of, uh, Mr. Stevens' wife. My wife? Captain, this is utter nonsense. Well, I don't know about that. Mr. Stevens, you're trembling like a leaf. Tell me now, just for fun, where was Mrs. Stevens that night? She was home. With me. The whole evening? I'm certain of it. As she retired early. Yes, but we both did. You, I suppose, were sound asleep by midnight? Yes, of course I was. Well, then how do you know where your wife was? Well, I... I... Look here, Stevens. She had to have a costume that would match Mrs. Despard's. How did she manage that? Where did she get it? She doesn't. She's never had a dress like that at all. And what about her motive? 
Why did she poison him? I... I don't know why she would. Not for money, certainly. Then why was it hate? Did she hate Miles Despard? I don't know. I just don't know, I tell you. Brennan, I phoned and got hold of Mr. Despard's nurse, all right. That Mrs. Stevens, though, couldn't reach her. Her phone won't answer. Okay. Go and have her picked up, then. I'm going home. Stevens, come back here. No, I'm going to get my wife. Want us to stop him? No, let him go for now. Marie! Marie, where are you? It's Ted! Marie! Oh, Marie, what have you done? Marie! Are you in the... Oh! Good evening. I hope you don't mind. I took the liberty of pouring myself a sherry. And just who are you? I? My name is Cross. Gordon Cross. Cross? Where's my wife? What have you done to her? If you've harmed her, I'll... I've done nothing at all, young man. Here, sit down and have a drink. You're lying! Something's happened to her. The police just phoned. There wasn't an answer. What's going on? Well, your wife, reading my chapter on the Dubrays, realized I knew more about the family than even she did. So she found my phone number on the front cover of the manuscript. And because I know an exceptional case when I hear one, I am here. Does that answer your question? No. And you know it doesn't. Can't you see I've got to... I've got to know whether... Yes, I see. Whether your wife is at Marie Dubray, who was burnt, burnt by order of the High Tribunal Court of France, witchcraft, black magic, the world across the threshold. You're quite sure, no doubt, also that I am Gordon St. Croix, who first wooed her. No, no, my boy. <laughs> no, my real name happens to be, of all things, Tom Simpson, most unsuitable for a distinguished writing career. And Marie Dubray is no more your wife's real name than mine is Gordon Cross. What? Your esteemed wife was an adopted child, Mr. Stevens, adopted by people in Canada named Dubray, remote members of the real family of poisoners. I, I can't believe it. Why didn't she tell me? Why? Because until I told her half an hour ago, she didn't know it herself. You see, in the course of my research on the family, I found out all about it. And in the course of talking with your wife, I found out something else. How for years she was haunted by the fear that she might be a poisoner by inheritance, by blood. And you can see, can't you, why she never talked about it, her past, to you? Yeah, I guess so. And yet, Mr. Stevens, you had all but made her forget that past, you. And that's why she was willing to lie, to steal a picture, do anything, in order to hold you to her. Yes, yes. I can see that now. You know, young man, I rather think she loves you. Mrs. Stevens, you may come out now. Hello, Ted. Marie, it's you. Oh, you're all right. Oh, yes, dear. We're both all right now, and nothing can change it ever. Oh, but Marie, listen. Don't say Marie, dear. Say Maggie. Maggie? Well, that's my name. My real name, Maggie McTavish. And it's a lovely name, dear. The most beautiful, gorgeous... Darling, that's great, but the police, they think it has something to do with Miles's death. They think I did it? So, now, Mr. Stevens, before we go back to the Despards, don't you think you'd better tell me everything that's been said and done up to date? Having just saved your wife's soul from the burning court, now I'll rest her body from the electric chair. Oh, you shouldn't have, Mrs. Stevens. I could have fixed a drink myself. <clears throat> well, that, ladies and gentlemen, is how I happen to be here. So let us consider first that supernatural hocus-pocus in the crypt, that body that walked out of the sealed tomb, that body that never was in the tomb. Wait, never in the tomb? No, Mr. Despard. The murderer knew that very soon Mrs. Henderson's story would bring about an investigation. 
He had to get rid of the well-known corpus delicti. Yes, but who could have kept the body out of the tomb? That who is you, sir. I, I don't understand. Well, it's very simple. You had the opportunity. I believe you said yourself you were alone with the body before the burial. And you had the strength. I dare say you carried it down to the furnace, where it's now probably nothing but ashes. A ridiculous. Why would he spend an hour smashing into a crypt for a body he knew wasn't there? Come now, that is obvious, Captain, to impress Mr. Stevens, his witness. It also had the added benefit of impressing you as well. This is all just perfectly fantastic. Fantastic? No, Lucy, just comic. And I suppose, Mr. Cross, that I also put on a woman's masquerade costume, went to my uncle's room, and handed him a nice cup of arsenic? No. No, no. That had to be done by a woman. Your accomplice, as a matter of fact. Oh, now. Come, come, you mustn't all look at Mrs. Despard, because Mark Despard's one noble act was his frantic effort to prevent his wife from being charged with the crime, a crime which he and Nurse Myra Corbett committed. Myra Corbett? Yes, Mr. Stevens, this lovely but quiet young lady beside me. But why would I do such a thing? Money, Miss Corbett. A cutout of Mark's sizable inheritance. Payments for services rendered. That's an absolute lie. You see, ladies and gentlemen, Captain Brennan never bothered to check Miss Corbett's whereabouts on the night of the murder. Why even think of the nurse? She was a custodian of the old man's health. You're crazy. Totally crazy. And yet, who but a nurse could so naturally offer the old man a cup? A cup he was sure contained medicine. You're making it up. The whole thing, you're just making it up, that's all. And who but Miss Corbett, living right here in this house, would know what kind of masquerade dress she must copy. Wouldn't know when Mrs. Henderson would pass the window that night. Pass and see her, and accept her, she hoped, for Lucy Despard. No. Goodness, no, I... <sighs> Oh, yes, Miss Corbett. Yes, Miss Corbett. That dress was the touch that wrecked you. That was your own idea, wasn't it? Not Mark's. You weren't content with the mere murderer's share of the profits. You wanted a wife's share, half of the whole estate. You wanted Lucy Despard convicted and out of the way for good. You know good. Oh, no need to be upset, dear girl. In fact, I toast you, Miss Corbett to a particularly ruthless poisoner. And yet, you know, on the whole, I'm rather partial to female poisoners. Why, only tonight I... <coughs> Stand back. Here, let me go to him. Mr. Cross... Oh, no. What's the matter with him, Brennan? This man is dead. And from cyanide, if I knew anything... Cyanide from that glass of sherry. Cyanide that a nurse could get quite easily. That glass was right beside you, Miss Corbett. And nobody else was near it. Too bad he didn't drink it as soon as you'd hoped. A second ago, we had no body to use against you. But we have now, Miss Corbett. We have now. And I arrest you for the murder of Godan Cross. Now, close to five months ago, the permanent author was murdered, and tonight Myra Corbett pays with her life for that crime. The former nurse at first protesting innocent in recent weeks has grown... Would you cut that off for a dear? I didn't think you wanted to be reminded of that nasty business. Oh, I don't really. But making such an effort to hide it only keeps it alive, doesn't it? Oh, all right, darling. Shall I make us cocktails before dinner? The largest one you've got. Fine, dear. I'll get out the ice cubes if... If I fix up the fire. Okay, Marie. Wherever papers, love. Right over by the bookcase we have some. And the name's not Marie. It's Maggie. Because, darling, Marie's dead and gone forever. What kind, Ted? 
Oh, any kind, darling. Any kind at all. And so, another body falls and another tale of suspense comes to a close. That was The Burning Court, adapted from a novel by John Dixon Carr, with special guests Shari Ambord and Sean Plodnicki. Next week, Joe Friday returns with her partner Ben Ramiro in Dragnet, The Helen Corday Murder. Retrostatic Radio is made possible from the generous donations of listeners like you. So please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com, where there is currently a contest being held for any tier to be able to win our upcoming first round of merchandise, beginning with brand new posters. However, if you'd like to make a one-time donation, then please go to the Retrostatic Radio page on ko-fi.com. And if you're a small business podcast or just otherwise want your brand on episodes of Retrostatic Radio, please email us at retrostaticradio at gmail.com to discuss our sponsorship opportunities. Sharing is caring, so please, if you enjoy this or any of our other broadcasts, sharing is caring, so please, if you enjoy this or any other of our broadcasts, Subscribe where possible, share wherever you can, and please follow our social media pages on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram for the latest fun from our social media team, Dawn the Squishy Fawn and Priscilla the Yarn Dragon. This concludes our broadcast day. Good night, and God bless.